<clears throat> okay. Um, good afternoon to uh, everyone who's tuning in. Um, this is going to be session 10 of our PDC. Just uh, get some people in. Greetings to you, uh, Caroline. And Simon, welcome. We're just getting ready for today's session. Hi. Hi there. Uh, how are you? <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nice Here we are again. Yes. Mm. How is your UK? Yeah, we had a bit of snow today. Yeah. But it's okay, yeah. But you've been having some rain, I think. Yeah, for us, we don't have rain yet. No? No, no rain this way. <laughs> oh, sorry for that. We've had some in Uganda, but... Yeah. Peso, Simon. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, it's a bit drier over there, but hopefully it's coming. Okay. You'll be ready for it when it comes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'll be ready. I'll be very ready. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Once it comes and you miss it, it's... it's... The big fun? Yes, German, German, Tapa here wants to say hi to you. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right. How are you? I'm very fine. Uh, and uh, it's good to hear from you. It's good uh, to be here are again. Fine. We are fine this week. Uh, well done. Well done, too. Good. I was just yeah, uh, working with no, Gerald. No. I've lost him now. Um, I have a few others coming. So... I'm looking forward to, so far I've done all the talking and um, and that's fine, but I'm looking forward to hearing more from you and more examples about what you're doing in, in, in TAPA, especially because I know it's, it'll be, it's really interesting, but it's also really inspiring to others. And, and, and Caroline as well, we'd love to hear a bit more about your work and understand how you're I understand that you're 
uh, coordinating several permaculture initiatives. Is that just in Natchivali? Is that in other places also? Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Steve. Everybody have a good uh, evening. It's evening here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I am. Um, reduce the volume there. Uh, I have several initiatives. I have a demonstration farm in Homa Bay County, Kindu Bay, that is in Kenya. Oh. Yes. And uh, I'm setting up another one this April in a place called Rongo. Um, yes. Okay. Yes, I specialize in teaching uh, women. <laughs> this comes from my days of being a, a gender rights activist. Uh, okay. But the reason why I'm insisting on uh, teaching mothers and their daughters is that it is the mothers who feel the heat when there is no food in the home. So sure. my feeling is that um, every woman, regardless of the fact that they don't own most of them don't own farms, but if given a small space, they should be able to have a food forest and a small kitchen garden that can be able <clears throat> to take care of the family's nutrition needs and food needs. Yeah. So I'm setting one, you know, <laughs> one garden at a time. And uh, in Kindu, yeah. last year I trained 20. TOTs, all were women, some were very young. And uh, this year I have the same goal and uh, maybe I would like to train maybe 25 or something. Well, that's fantastic, Caroline. That's really interesting. And of course, yeah, I mean, very much in line with our own experiences and really stressing, yeah, the value of empowering women to have access to yeah even small plots of land in a way in which it doesn't create mm -hmm. um conflict sometimes with the husbands it can be then people you know yeah we understand it can be it can create complexities too <clears throat> yes i'm interested to hear you you're also in homer bay so um we have a very close friend paul agola there in homer bay also who is training a lot of people. There's 40 people there doing this course, in fact, with us. Okay. Paul Ogola taught me. Right. Uh, in my first PDC in 2021. Okay. Yeah, and that is where okay, I- Okay, so now it all comes to together. Doors. That's great. <laughs> so you were yes. already a student of our academy, and now you're coming back and you're doing the theory with us again. So th that's a really good way to do it. Yes, um, Paul, Paul, Paul ignited the fire and I was like, I need to know more. That's where I came to know the name Steve Jones. And okay. yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, great. That's really super. Yes. Gerald, I see your hand up. Uh, no, I was, you know, that's interesting. That's uh, brilliant to hear. I was just excited about that. I was just clapping. Oh, good to meet you. It's a small world. <laughs> wow. This is something. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is this is both to Caroline and to Simon. Is something that Gerald and I have been interested all along is this idea of creating clusters. Because if you can have a group of people in a small area who are interested in permaculture and they can create demonstration sites, then that can that becomes very powerful. And I think we need to be there to support each other, you know, to sort of build that momentum. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, and it fits direct into, you know, sort of our strategy, the replicate or sort of you have, uh, when we were doing uh, uh, those science in primal and everything, they told us of how the amoeba keeps its reproduction. It would keep splitting, it grows, splits, you know, that continuously. So that's where we are looking. And, you know, we are happy to learn that, you know, <laughs> Karen 
is splitting, uh, not necessarily splitting, but sort of um, <laughs> coming out of another hub. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Gerald thank you so much yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> actually yeah, we, uh, you know yeah. the, the the reason why I decided to do this is because um, during the PDC there were less than five women and out of the five I think I'm the only one who consistently went through the PDC and by the end of it all I was like these ladies need to be here. They need to hear this, you know, because this is a game changer for them. And that is why um, I'm preaching the gospel to the women. All I require, especially for the women who, who we support to come, is that you need to be there for the full 10 days. And even if you have small children, you come along with them but you need to be there for the full 10 days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a brilliant strategy. No, you know, it is. Consistence. I mean, we recognize that it's a big commitment of time, but then this is very significant knowledge and to really take it on board, you need more than a, uh, you know, and, 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 and then to realize that it's ongoing, you only really learn permaculture by doing it. You know, we're, we're just talking about is one thing, but you've got to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Okay, after, after the 10 days PDC, we usually train the women every month, three days, every month, three days. And we follow up and see what they're doing mm. back at, uh, at their homes. Yeah. <clears throat> so by the time you are uh, graduating as a trainer, you know, you've had the 10 day PDC, you've had about seven or eight months of you know three days training yeah and you are practicing we've gone back and seen that you're practicing I, 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 and again and i, I it's really cool to do the follow-up visit and to come yeah. of them and, and and get people over the first hurdles you know that might, whatever it is that might be holding them back um, yes um, and um, once people have had a, a few easy successes, then suddenly the world opens. Yeah, and and the reality is, I think uh, Paul could have taken you through that. When we used that approach, it was like 110% successful. You know, mm -hmm. yes, at the onset or when someone finishes the PDC, they are fired, they are equally fired, but then yeah. if they don't get that additional kind of support or bits of reinforcement, mm -hmm. sometimes it's inevitable, especially in the midst of uh, different commitments mm -hmm. and uh, probably things like cri uh, these other crisis after crisis is it's inevitable for the frame to somehow try to die down. But if you mm -hmm. have that sort of support, it reinforces yeah. up to a point mm -hmm. where let's <clears throat> say it's irreversible. This person has now, it has really become a part of them. It's not the initial kind of force, <clears throat> the initial, inertia but now it's a part of them yeah yes wow, brilliant. yes and um and the, what i really what impressed me with the women when we were going you know going around to their homes we found <coughs> they had already you know i don't know whether it's by diffusion or osmosis other women around them were also coping because we were telling them you don't have to chop down trees in order to grow your food you know so we found some other people were also wondering what's this crazy things you people are trying to do and yeah. you know i i that that really got me <clears throat> I, I i was very um i felt nice <laughs> i felt <clears throat> very good about that <laughs> well I'm, I'm sure simon will agree with you there that in 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 tapa in in uh in teso district there 
it's mm-hmm. really spread quickly. And I think what people are looking, oh, you're doing it differently. What, what's that about? And then as soon as they've got an inkling, they want to try. And I yes. think, <clears throat> I mean, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, and right now, Taba is again giving birth to more two groups of certain, certain people who, who are interested in the PDC class that we always do in the recap. They are very happy with what we are doing to them and more so they are giving appreciation to you for having sponsored Papa for the education that you have rendered to them. They are so happy that it enabled them to have a good life whereby they were not wasting the little resources that they were having at that time. They utilize it well. Mm-hmm. And their families were moving well. They were in question to purchase whatever. So farms are trying to come in, though it is dry time, but people are preparing it where necessary, so long as support is being rendered to them and knowledge is rewarded to them. They are calling upon for permaculture because it, it has been a driving force for them in their community, in their homes, financially. <laughs> And, and everything. And they are now, they are asking me a lot that you should at least get for us uh, a vetiver, vetiver grass. You see, they are interested in that grass so much. So I don't know, basically, you can help Simon and Tapa and Abad and the new groups that are coming in. I don't know. Simon, I can bring you vetiver from Kenya. We have lots yes. of them. Yes, I can bring yes. you vetiver. Um, last time yes. I carried some to Nakivale, and yes. Uh, yes, they were planted somewhere. They have been watering them despite the drought, and they are looking lovely. I can bring you vetiver. <laughs> yes, Caroline, that, that is nice to hear from you. I would be warmly welcoming you, and the groups will be so happy to see you with that vetiver. Okay. Wow, that's yeah. amazing, you know. And... You know, as the story is, I will tell you one of the stories quick. So we go to Northern Uganda, we do the training, pick out the pioneers, take them to a training place. So they were slightly out of the community for about two weeks. And anyway, where they went, where we were doing the training was sort of a town. All, uh, so they expected them to be living posh and everything. When they returned, they were really fired up and they started doing the compost, uh, digging up, you know, pe- uh, you know, the pits and doing uh, soils and everything. Then some of them were like, oh, uh, the people who had stayed behind, some of them were asking, really, did you go... To, to the hotel or to where you've been to come back and do this, you know, start turning rubbish around, digging and turning up the soil and all that. But three months down the road, the story had changed. Those who were wondering and asking why these people were turning or doing compost, turning, smelly, picking, you know, all the cow dung around and using it. Now they were coming to ask, oh, how come your gardens are looking different? Why is it different here? Oh, your homestead is now turning so green. So it has always been the case. And that's when now we emphasize the educate, uh, rep- Educate, demonstrate, replicate in whichever, you know, sequence it is. Initially, yes, educate, let people replicate, keep educating them or educate them, demonstrate, and they will replicate. What we found is that when people see it, as you, as you say, Gerald, when people start to can see permaculture, they see the demonstration, then now they're asking the questions. Now we want the education. Um, and I think that's a great way to go. And if we can inspire people through seeing working examples and then, you know, then go, oh, what's this about? You know, and that's how we begin the conversation. 
Yes. Um, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, please. They are they are they are welcoming. They are welcoming the class, they are, and they are very interested in it. And it is our role, me and the chairman Tapa and the coordinator. We are trying our level best. Coordinator, that is depot. We are trying our level best to see that we are impacting permaculture to the rest of those localities, eastern region of Uganda. That, that's really and, inspiring, Simon. And and you know, it, it makes us feel as well that what we're doing is really worthwhile because it's that passing on of knowledge. That's what we're interested in. Uh, that yes. process and and what Gerald and I want to understand is oh yeah how we can support that process but also how we can learn from it and help spread that experience help spread that learning mm. so um, there is in the, here in the United Kingdom there is a, a permaculture association it's, it's a charity and it exists to support obviously permaculture learning and to help build case studies and experience. And I used to work for them about 20, creating a new post for an international coordinator. And I'm very keen to work with these networks again, because I want to tell the stories and share the learning of exactly what you're telling me now, you know, and um, hopefully we can use these existing networks to you know to put this out there a little bit that um i, I feel that we've learnt, all learned a lot in recent years and to see how paul has helped train caroline and caroline has gone on and started her own groups she's understood the need for connecting with especially female uh, women-led groups now this is fantastic and then the whole tapper experience is really accelerating too so you know this is this is great news I might ask you to, to mute, Caroline, if you're not, you're welcome to contribute, but if you're not contributing, do, thank you, um, just so we don't get any whistles and pings and things. Um, okay, so I notice it in my notes, I don't know quite how I thought I was going to do this, but is on the one hand, I'm following David Holmgren's principles, and I'm also trying to follow the chapters of Bill Mollison's book. They don't always quite connect together. Chapter 10 in the Permaculture Designer's Handbook is about the humid tropics. So that's very much um, uh, you guys, although it's not quite as humid as it used to be, perhaps. But anyway, and then and the other theme is still thinking about using and valuing natural resources and services. And I like to take some time out of this, this point in the PB, PDC to look into energy and to think about how important energy is and our sources of energy within the context of use and value natural resources and services. So we're going to do that a little bit and then maybe we'll weave around and get back to talking about the humid tropics chapter in the designer's handbook. So much to permaculture. Um, so this is my story about energy and I, I, I how I like to tell this and I hope it's useful to you I'm going to go on a little bit of a sidetrack but it, it's actually um, it's very very important <clears throat> <clears throat> so this first part of the lecture I've called our energy future and oh, Gerald, you I put made you co-host of the room, so perhaps you could manage people arriving and what have you. As you always, as always, and as you do so well. Um, <clears throat> so here we are with our definition of permaculture, just to begin to think about this again. That you know, we're guided by our ethics. But the question is, how, how do we fulfill those ethics? 
our Earth Care People Care Fair Share. And we're reminded to allow ourselves to learn from nature through our principles. And we're developing a, a sort of a toolkit of design tools that we can um, activate our aspirations. Now, those design tools, a lot of it involve Yes, it's the techniques and the skills and the, and, and the processes, but I think a lot of it is about the human skills, about you know, how we pass on knowledge, how we inspire other people, how we involve other people, um, how we empower them to do things. Um, and I think as, as we go on, I want us to think more and more about the, this human side of it as well. So um, and when we talk about energy, you'll see what I mean by that. So um, this is a made up image, it's not a real image, but it's trying to say something very important to you. And what we're seeing is an oil tanker, Exxon written on it, of course, the world's biggest oil company or one of huge uh, uh, conglomerate company. And what we're seeing in the foreground, of course, is some people traveling by camel. And apparently, there is a Saudi Arabian saying that goes something like this. My father rode a camel. I drive a car. My son flies a plane. My grandson will ride a camel. Obviously, what we're saying here is the oil wealth that has come to nations like Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, uh, United States, Russia, uh, you know, uh, Venezuela, of course. Um, it's a bit of a lottery. Certain, some, certain countries seem to have a lot, Angola. Certain countries seem to have quite a lot of oil and others have a little bit and very many have none. Oil is a strange thing. It is fossilized algae, um, whereas coal is, is fossilized trees. And, and the only reason these exist is because during the process of evolution, 600 million years ago to 300 million years ago, there were no microbes that could break down the lignum fibers in trees. So instead of are uh, breaking down and becoming compost as we see that the decaying process they became layered into the earth's crust where they were changed by heat and pressure and where certain very species existed oil formed trapped in, in porous rocks and <clears throat> is there you know as a resource now, uh, um, oil have and the coal, gas, and oil these these fossilized resources is they're a one off. They only happened once to be created <clears throat> due to a certain set of circumstances. And <clears throat> once they're gone, they're gone. And <clears throat> so we need to be wary that we've um, built a global economy, a, an economic model that requires us to use more and more of these actually finite resources. I'm going to take you into that. Let's think about what that means. And let's ask ourselves, do we have alternatives? Are there other ways out? What, what can we do as individuals, as communities, and therefore what we might do as, as, as nations even? To understand that, this oil bonanza, this, this huge quantity of energy that is available to us, is, it's fossilized energy. It's fossilized sunlight. It's a one-off uh, bonus. So, 
In uh, just off the northwest west coast of Africa, off uh, Morocco, the Moroccan coast, it's a series of volcanic islands called the Canaries. One of those islands is called Lanzarote, and it's it's a relatively new, recent volcanic landscape that's <clears throat> just rocks and things and very elemental. And there's a um, a famous artist who, who comes from there. His name is Cesar Manrique, and he created a whole school of art exploring the landscape in Lanzarote. And what he was fascinated, and this is an example of his work, what he was fascinated with was working with a natural feature. Um, and in the, the rear of this, we're seeing just a natural regrowth, I think, on in a what is a volcanic crater. But then he's then interacted with it and in, 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 in some of his art you really can't see the join between a natural form and a man-made form a human-made form and he, he, he likes to explore the transition from one to other so he's someone who's thought deeply about how humans interact with the environment and he's thought deeply about our relationship our space within that and about the consequences of what we do and having he's passed away now but he he he, he you know he lived a ripe old age and if you go and visit his house there's literally this statement is written on the wall so i saw it as the writing on the wall and he said this i believe that we are witnessing an historical moment where the huge danger to the environment is so evident that we must conceive a new responsibility with respect to the future. So he said that in 1987, five years before the Rio Earth Summit, and a, a, a prescient statement, the writing on the wall, that means something we cannot ignore, something we have to pay attention to, is we must conceive a new responsibility with respect to the future. And I would suggest that permaculture is a very big part of that, um, of how we might begin to understand and act on this responsibility that we have in respect to nature. And of course, we've already told you, and, and we're continuing to explore is, the way that we change the world, the way that we create change is to begin with ourselves and our home and our community which is what we're doing. So we're beginning to meet, we're beginning to think about how we meet our needs and how, thinking about our relationship with this natural world and to do this in a conscious and thoughtful way. Okay. Um, this is a talk about the future and we're gonna little, have a little think about where do we think we're going as a society and as an economy and, and, and what, can, what, what do we expect that's going to happen? And obviously, this isn't an easy answer, a simple answer. And let's also approach this from the point of view that, well, we don't exactly know. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't see into the future. But this image here is from um, a book called Future Scenarios. It's written by David Holmgren, the co-founder of Permaculture. And he wants to think about the interplay, the relationship between these two very powerful forces that are currently shaping our world. One of these is climate change. The more we burn oil, the more we load the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, which traps more energy into the atmosphere it stops the energy uh, bouncing back out into space and it makes our energy our climate systems more intense or energized and um that means that it might be hotter it might be drier it might be colder they might be wetter we might go longer periods of time without rain and then when rain comes it's a downpour all of these aspects of what we can expect with climate change. David Holmgren wants to, us to consider that 
climate change is, it's happening, it's coming on to us, but we don't know exactly how bad it's going to be. We don't know exactly how fast it's going to be. So he's given us a, a continuum, an arrow. He's saying on this side, we move in this direction, climate change is happening faster and faster and more, you know, it's more of a significant. So we need to think about those, that, those possibilities. On the other hand, it might not be quite so bad and it might unfold much more slowly and we might have more time to adapt. So that's what he's, he's not saying he knows which is the answer. What he's saying is we need to think about both of those possibilities. Now, the <clears throat> very powerful force at play is a thing called peak oil. And <clears throat> I'll unpack that idea a little bit for you. But basically, it's this. <clears throat> we don't know exactly how much oil there is in the Earth's crust. Um, we've been pumping it out there for, for, for about 120 years now. But the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> we generally <clears throat> have extracted the easiest to access uh, sources first. <clears throat> we began with the easy stuff. <clears throat> As we move further and further away, <clears throat> we travel further, we drill deeper in the ground, we <clears throat> the profitability of that starts to go down. So <clears throat> the first thing that we've learned by looking into peak oil is, what's interesting is, <clears throat> the world's never going to run out of oil. There's loads of it. But <clears throat> it's a lot of it is not that easy to get hold of. So the question is, how much are we prepared to pay for oil? Because it's going to get more and more expensive. And we'll look at that <clears throat> again. Is But again, David is saying, he doesn't know the answer to this question. Peak oil might come, come across, come upon us very quickly and very severely. In that case, we don't have much time. Or it might unravel more slowly and we have time for a, a, a longer time for transition. So those are the two concepts and he's put them sort of at right angles to each other. And he's saying that these two, these different realities create four very different scenarios. Um, in this quarter, if, if, if the onset of peak oil, energy prices become very high, energy becomes scarce. If that happens quite quickly, and climate change is also sudden, abrupt, and very strong, is we're in this red zone. We're going to have serious problems, serious migrations, disturbances. We're going to be in a kind of survival mode. So he kind of calls that a sort of collapse scenario or lifeboat um something that we might have to just really withdraw into just thinking about our own personal survival now let's hope that that's not where we get to but there's a thinking behind this which is very useful permaculture thinking um okay i'm gonna just i think i've got a few more slides to get into on this so let's just think about this we're just thinking about these two interplay of these two concepts so David is saying, mate, there's four possible energy futures. And, and I actually think in some ways, all four of these are playing out in front of us right now in different countries to different degrees. Um, that, that, we look at this graph is, this is historical time along the bottom. So there's the past looking at whatever, thousands of years ago. And, and then here's us at the present day and there's, here's us going into the future. And on this axis, we're looking at the amount of energy and resources that we use as in total humanity. Um, also our population and a reflection of the energy our energy use and our population use is pollution, is the amount of pollution climate change, all sorts of other kinds of forms of pollution that we're causing 
is accelerating and from being very, very low historically to about the beginning of the industrial area, industrial revolution, which was about 1750, it was now 250, 270 years ago. Um, and we've had this, this modern period, this industrial ascent, and our population has risen, our resource use has risen, our water use has risen, our consumption of the natural world has risen, and climate change is getting worse. So the question is, can we just carry on? Is there a possibility for a sort of a, a technological explosion? Can we keep inventing new technologies that allow that to continue on that same trajectory? I think we've been told quite clearly that, that is not possible. And we call this techno optimism or a techno fantasy because the, we're already reaching very real limits to, uh, to, uh, to, to a certain kind of growth. So <clears throat> the next pathway, perhaps, that we might achieve globally, or think about it locally as well, is, OK, we've grown and grown and grown, and our re re resource use has accelerated. Can we maybe, you know, trim the sales a bit? Can we cut back a bit on our consumption and find a stable state whereby, yeah, this is a sustainable option? Um, and the truth is, we've gone past the point of that. But I would also argue is some countries are much closer to that than others. And, and, and we'll have a think about that as well. So um, as I say, in reality, all four of these are kind of happening. Um, if, if what this graph here is saying is if we carry on as we are, business as usual, keep polluting, keep burning, keep damaging, keep using up resources, what will happen is we'll hit a collapse point and we'll see economies, hugely contract, uh, all sorts of problems escalate and, uh, and you know, we're really into a survival situation. Um, and I think we've been told that our failure to act, a failure to anticipate the changes that are coming will definitely catapult us into a situation of collapse and of great vulnerability. Um, so somewhere between a kind of little bit of reduction into a sustainable say, state and collapse, David Hongwood is arguing is that permaculture comes in between the two. And it's what we might call a creative response, a managed descent, uh, uh, or let's say a deliberate avoidance of building yourself up to that level. So I'm seeing how you guys are living in in in, in Teso different distant dis, district in Uganda and you're already close to you, you you're not in a huge energy dependent situation and with good planning and investment using permaculture you can steer a path to something that actually is potentially long-term sustainable anyway we go on so david is also saying david hongwen is also saying really the outcomes are in our hands it's what we choose now as our priorities what we choose to invest in that will shape and create th this this possible future that we're heading towards. Um, you know, we've had <clears throat> the IPCC, the Interglobal uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has held a series of these COP Conference of Partners conferences each year since I think 87. Um, looking at, 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 at sort of big scale scenarios, what should governments be doing and businesses be doing and what are our priorities on the global level. But I think in permaculture, we should be thinking, 
how do we respond as individuals, as households, as communities, you know, on a local level, on a bottom up level? And what we were talking about just earlier, this idea of demonstrate, educate, replicate. Can we demonstrate, you know, by exploration, find ways forward that many other people can learn from and benefit from? Because I think this is what we need. This is our priority now for investment and for going forward. So we go back to David's four scenarios. And look, he's given us a time scale of 2020 to 2050. So we don't know exactly when. He's not saying he knows all the answers, but he's saying, look, guys, we know that global warming is real. It might be fairly benign and slow, uh, or it might be really quite fast and very destructive. So how, <clears throat> how that plays out depends on what kinds of opportunities we have. So here's the other axis where we're talking about on this side is a slow oil decline that we slowly, slowly transition away from, from, from coal, gas and oil. Or on this side, we're saying a really fast uh, oil decline. If we, if, if we get off oil at 10% a year, we're going to crash the economy. What, what would that look like? Well, so the scary, the, the, the scariest scenario is this one is where global warming hits us really fast and we run out of oil really quickly. We suddenly haven't got enough energy. Here's a picture of a man, uh, I think he's ca uh, filleting a kangaroo, a wild animal he's caught. Um, David calls it lifeboats. And I thought that was interesting. He doesn't call it collapse. He's saying, look, if the global economy were to collapse, we'd have to raft together, wouldn't we, as communities and take care of each other. And then slowly, slowly from our lifeboats, we could work out our plan going forward. But our first thing, our first priority is to save ourselves, our families and our communities, because that's something we can do. Okay, so that's what we're already preparing ourselves uh, in some ways by getting to know each other, by educating ourselves, by putting systems in place. Down on this side, um, on the right hand side, he's saying, if global warming is fairly slow, or you know, is relatively slower and slightly more benign, as in not too desperately bad, or we can come off oil quick enough, we can have a fast oil decline that we've prepared for, then that brings us into the earth stewardship thing. This is permaculture. This is what we're doing. So hopefully, if we can transition away from oil fast enough, the climate change isn't too destructive, we have a chance to follow through on the, the, the very concepts and ideas that we're working with here. So, um, hey, let's go up to this quadrant here, because this is an interesting one, is what he's saying here is, if, climate ch if, if uh, global warming, climate change, again, is fairly slow and it doesn't get too bad, but also is we have a good energy supply without it causing too much global warming, that gives us a chance to transition from this brown tech polluting economy to a green tech, clean economy. So here we're seeing, I don't know, biofuels and wind farms and electric cars and so forth. The final scenario is that we ignore it all. We carry on, we ignore climate change, global warming, and we keep investing in the remaining oil reserves. We don't care what the price is. We just keep pumping, keep extracting it. And what David Holmgren says about this scenario is in the brown tech future, the world will become more and more authoritarian. Governments will become very strong and corporates will become very strong. And the individual, us, will be sort of crushed um, because to deny reality, as in climate change, and 
to, to and, and to ignore all of the warning signs and carry on as you are is we will want to protest people will rise up people will not be happy and the governments will have to enforce what they're doing because great majority of people won't want it to happen and sadly this is what seems to be happening very much in the united states in the uk and certain western countries right now is we're saying we care but in reality our governments are taking us down a more and more authoritarian route look they're trying to start a war in ukraine which is largely over gas and gas fields this is not how we're going to solve our problems so given time and we've it, it, and if we're proactive which i strongly believe we should be we should be and can be investing in mixture of the green tech and the permaculture that's how um <clears throat> That's our only way to insulate ourselves from the challenges of the future. Um, if things start breaking down, I mean, look, we've got four scenarios here. I can tell you all four of these are happening in different countries. We've seen collapse happen in certain countries. Look at the, 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 the mess that is in Somalia or Iraq is not good. Libya is not good. Um, uh, Syria also the, 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 the war in Syria was also in part triggered by failing crops migrating people um, and these are not good signs as I say this sort of increasingly autocratic um, brown technology that's happening in America that's happening with very powerful forces here in the UK I think we might see a lot of Europe be the because with these Western countries, of course, are the countries most invested in the status quo and the Saudi Arabia and Australia and, and countries that have huge carbon reserves, Russia, uh, Venezuela, they're not going to be willing to move away from that unless the rest of the world can bring them with them. So green tech, countries like Costa Rica in Central America are already 100% running on new renewable energy, probably not for transport, but they are for their energy grid. I know that Nicaragua has the aim to be 100% geothermal, just to be powered by the hot rocks from and you know, fissures in the Earth's crust. Um, Iceland, um, Bhutan is in the Earth stewardship uh, 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 quadrant. There's examples out there to follow, and we can be pioneers in these green tech and earth stewardship areas. And I think what we take from David Holmgren's scenario planning here is we've got to, you've got to, you don't want to be investing in the wrong things. And it might be scary to think about this, but if we know these changes are coming, we can prepare ourselves much more for them. So I think that's what we need to think about. Okay. I'm going to talk more generally about energy. I've, I've mentioned this, this peak oil. I've mentioned energy descent. Now that's the idea, that especially the Western countries where we, we are so reliant on fossil fuel energy. Can we map a pathway where we slowly, uh, you know, decarbonize our economies? Now, and to be honest, we've been talking about this for a long time, but we have not achieved it. And it concerns me when I see also countries in the global south that think they need to follow these Western development models, because as Western development models it make you reliant on imported energy and, and agricultural uh, chemicals. So we need to think about that a lot okay i'm going to talk more generally about energy and before we get into the energy descent thing i want to say some good news up 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 tempo things um is we will never run out of energy in fact energy can't be destroyed it only dissipates it moves from one state to another um there's lots of it 
It's just, this is the key thing we need to learn is it's just that in the natural systems, in nature, energy tends to be very diffuse. It's, it's spread out. Um, and with fossil fuels, we've been spoiled and we've lost our perspective. Um, and so, you know, maybe our ancestors might remember how hard the work was, you know, without the machinery, without the oil, without the power, but we're kind of forgetting that. So, you know, I like to say, remember, water flows downhill always, you know, it comes out of the sky and it flows downhill. So why do we use irrigation? That means we're pumping water uphill. Now, irrigation has helped farmers enormously. But what are those pumps powered by? They're powered by diesel. So if you're pumping water uphill, you're becoming reliant on fossil fuels. The permaculture way is to catch and store water high in the system and get as many uses out of it before you let it go. That's the difference. We're reminded when we think about oil, and specifically I'm talking about oil is, but oil and then petrol, there's no substitute. There's nothing that we're going, there's nothing else out there that we can swap it for. When people talk about hydrogen fuel cells and things like that, and they do have a use, but they're nowhere near, nothing else is as energy dense as oil or, or petrol. You think about it, if you compress petrol, any more petrol into a space than it is, it explodes. It's actually how your carburetor works. Um, so, and the density of energy is what makes it as, as a, of a fuel, is what gives it its real value. So that's something that I want us to understand. So my key point is, we shouldn't be asking, it's not about how much energy is there is out there, because there's endless amounts. The question we need to ask is how dense is the forms of energy that we can use? And uh, to be a useful form of energy, it needs to be dense. So look, here's the thing. Think about how much energy there might be in, 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 in some wood, in, in a bundle of sticks, and then compare that to how much energy there might be in uh, a gallon of gasoline. And the difference is colossal. So if you were to try and power, well, anyway, you get it. <clears throat> if we're really interested in energy density, then the next thing we realize is that the rate at which we consume energy actually defines whether something is a viable energy resource at all. So what, what, what we really mean by that is you need to use energy really efficiently. And if you're using it really efficiently, maybe you can power your world with sticks rather than oil, but we need to be much more efficient and we need to learn the lessons, the physics, maybe of how our ancestors used energy, but also we need to bring modern ideas and modern thinking into really creating really efficient appliances, really efficient ways of using energy. So um, we're, 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 that, that, that's where we're going. We're really interested in the efficient use of energy. Um, I don't know the maths of this exactly, but let's just say um, rather the gallon of oil, let's say a gallon of petrol. And let's say that um, if you, uh, how much energy is in a gallon of petrol? And I think the, the I think the calculation is, is if you had something like a, a bicycle generator or a hand generator, it would take you something like four weeks of turning a generator by hand to generate the amount of energy that's in one gallon of petrol. That's a month's work. So I think when a car or a lorry is driving around, it's consuming enormous amounts of energy just in moving along. 
that's what I, also what I mean about how we've sort of lost our sense of perspective about energy. Um, again, especially in the West. Okay, so key, key things to remember. I've already said water flows downhill, warm air rises. We want to learn to work with energy naturally. So we want to understand how things move, how things operate. We, the idea is to match the patterns. So in nature, energy occurs in patterns. There are seasons. Um, things are available at one time and they're not available at others. There's also, um, you know, the sun shines in the day and doesn't in the night. So you can trap the energy in from the sun during the day, but if you've failed to do that, you missed your moment. So it's what we mean by matching the patterns. Okay. It's not about how much energy is out there in the world. The key question is, at what rate can we access it? Can we extract it? Um, because especially if we move off fossil fuels, it's already saying, well, there's lots of solar energy, but how do we, how do we get hold of it? We've got to build infrastructure to capture that and to use it. Um, so again, I like to say to people is, a good way to think about energy is, imagine if I tell you, you're a millionaire, you're a billionaire, you're a multi-billionaire, you can be as rich as you like. But I'm gonna say you can only access your money from an ATM machine. And let's say you can only take out $100 a day or $10 a day, whatever, it doesn't matter the amount. So, yes, sure, I'm as rich as you can think, but you could only extract a small portion of that wealth each day. So your challenge is to live within that energy income. So the, think of the, the, the strength of the sun and think how many billion years the sun might run for. That's your unlimited wealth, but you could only trap so much of that through plants, solar panels, you know, you can only extract the, the, that solar energy at a certain rate. So we have to construct a society that can live within its solar income. And if we can do that for ourselves and we, and we can increasingly build, uh, you know, collaborate to do that for our communities, that's how we build our resilience. It's a big deal. Look, um, Especially if you go on the internet and you start talking to people about energy, and there's a lot of wishful thinking out there. There's lots of people who talk about free energy machines um, and um, the idea that, yeah, there might be other technologies, other ways in which you could access energy. Um, the idea of perpetual motion machine. Well, very attractive ideas. Sure, and, and worth looking into, but, but there are limiting factors in our world. And one way of thinking it is of is entropy, friction, drag, um, um, any form of energy transfer is not going to be 100% efficient. There's going to be waste. Some of it will be lost as heat, energy, dissipates. So if we pass energy from one thing back to another, back to another, eventually there's nothing left. And that is described in the second law of thermodynamics. And actually all of our physics is kind of built on that. So for us to try and imagine something beyond that is not realistic. So let's understand that it's, that there is no free energy. But to understand energy, we need to get this very important idea on board. And this is, this is how we get it, is to understand that, okay, there's no such thing as a free lunch. But what there is, is there is a ratio, relationship between how much energy you put into something to how much you get out. And we can call that the energy profit ratio or energy return on energy invested. EROI. 
energy return on investment. There's our abbreviation. That's how we remember it. But that's what I mean by that. And I'm going to expand on that because to understand energy, you need to understand EROI, energy return on investment. Ain't nothing free. There's the second law of thermodynamics. I looked it up on Wikipedia. There's a reminder that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is climbing and climbing and climbing, and it's an ever increasing problem that we have to face up to. So it looks like on a graph over the last thousand years. Yes, the weather has always changed. Yes, the carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere has wavered. There are many factors that affect it. There's no doubt about that. But as soon as you get to 1750, 1800, um, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, we see average temperatures climb and climb and climb, and we see carbon dioxide in the atmosphere climb and climb and climb. There's a correlation. This is why we understand that it's a mistake to keep investing in fossil fuels. We have to think beyond. And to do that, we have to, you know, it's kind of free the shackles of our minds a little bit. Um, there's also lots of, uh, well, not so much legally binding targets, but there's a very big discussion, of course, across the world about our responsibilities to reduce our emissions. And in 2015, the world signed the Paris Climate Agreement, which says, we have to completely get off fossil fuels by 2050. So, and we need to halve our use of fossil fuels in this decade, not keep growing them, we need to halve it. And that's gonna be a colossal challenge. But challenges create opportunities and the world right now needs leadership in these areas. And I'm looking to you guys in Africa because you're the only people who already live at sustainable rates of energy use. And if we can, instead of trying to think ways of encouraging you guys to use more energy, can we find ways to, to optimize energy use so we can have an increase in living standards without an increase in emissions, without using more oil, without needing external inputs of energy all the time. That's what we have to get to. Uh, okay, I'll skip over this graph. It's a little complicated. But what it's actually saying is, we've had all these targets. And in some ways, the UK have been very good at reducing its emissions so far. But actually, all we've done, because it's saying here, look, we've been quite good. But actually, all we've done is, um, all right, so this shows what happens if we factor in exports and imports. And the UK and the USA um, actually are claiming that they've reduced their emissions, but they haven't. Because what they've done is they've moved all their heavy industry to China and we now import it. So if China make the steel, those emissions are on China and we can import it into Britain and make our cars out of it and pretend it's not our pollution. Well. Solving this problem is way more than a counting trick. I guarantee you that. We've actually got to do it for real. So, um, and I only see this happening if, if we can really find leaders and pioneers in these areas. And, and, and I think permaculture has a big role to play. If you're interested in the <clears throat> whole climate change thing and you want to, hear the science actual science but in plain english this is the website it's called skeptical science uh and it's at skepticalscience.com and <clears throat> it's a very deep exploration of the science of climate change and <clears throat> and um it also takes apart a, a lot of the sort of myths, the things that people say, oh, it's not really that bad, or it's changed, climate's changed before. Yeah, true, but not like this. And the answers to those questions are also held on this website, should you want to go deeper on the subject. Okay. 
energy profit ratio, energy return on investment. There we go. So food is energy. We can't survive without food. So here's, here's a predator animal, a fox, and he's got the prey, he's caught a rabbit. <clears throat> predator animal to survive, there must be more energy in its prey, more energy in the rabbit than the work, the energy that the fox had to expend to catch the rabbit. Otherwise, it would die. So the way this represents not a free lunch, but the fox had to do work. It had to run down the rabbit and catch it. And if it didn't do it successfully after a few times, it would run at a deficit and it wouldn't be strong enough to catch the rabbit and eventually it would die. So let's think about that's what I mean by it's not a free lunch. Even if you just went and caught it in the bush, you still had to do the work to go out there, find it, locate it, catch it, eat it. <clears throat> now, we're told, forgiven for having this in the forefront of your mind, that with seven and a half billion people on the planet, really the only way we're going to feed everyone is industrial farming. We need big farms, we need big machines, we need, you know, uh, seed technology, we need fertilizers, we need pesticides. Come on, this is, this is, this is the modern way. This is how you've, we need GM, genetically modified, we need the whole lot. Surely we need high-tech machinery, we can use satellites to monitor the health of the plants, uh, their need for, for, for fertilizers. These things can be automated. We have technology, come on, surely, this is the way to feed the world. Um, of course, so about 35% of the world's food is produced through industrial methods like this, 35%. About 15%, 10, 15% is <clears throat> caught from the wild. Here's a big ocean trawler catching loads of fish. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing a scale here, uh, comparing the super tanker to an a, a, a African pirogue, a, a, a small, um, <clears throat> these are giant ships going out to the ocean and pulling tons and tons of fish out, processing it <clears throat> on board the ship, freezing it, bringing it back to land. This is this accounts for nearly fifteen percent of the wolves are caught from the wilds as well, <coughs> but it's mainly fish. So there's about thirty-five percent of the world's food is there in agriculture, industrial agriculture. Fifteen percent extracted from the wild in the form of of big sea ocean trawlers and fishing and and, and, and things like that. And then you've got your subsistence small farmers. This is just a library pick, uh, women growing cassava. And um, I was imagining in this picture that this is organic cultivation. They haven't imported energy from outside. They're literally working with the sun, the soil, kind of permaculture style. Um, so it'd be interesting to think what's the energy profit ratio we thought about the fox what's the energy in energy out return for industrial farming what's the energy in energy out return industrial fishing what's the energy in and energy out return for subsistence farming now i haven't quite got my figures figures right here but what we know is that this kind of Intensive agriculture actually consumes at least 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of food. And then that food's got to be processed, transported, uh, retail, uh, brought home and cooked. Um, 
So it consumes way more energy than it produces. Think of the energy footprint of the machine, of building that machine and maintaining it, of the parts that wear out as it's used, the tires and so forth, and obviously the diesel that it's consumed, consumed by the driver, um, and, and, and everything else in the process, of course. And the fertilizer is made from natural gas. The pesticides are made from fossil fuels, from petrol chemicals. This kind of farming actually is really a system that turns oil into food. It doesn't really produce anything. And unfortunately, it's also damaging the soils. This can't be the future. And in fact, this kind is really very vulnerable to climate change. If you've got a big one huge field and you have a flood or a drought or locusts come, you lose everything. When you have a patchwork of small different crops and tree crops and ground crops and you know different types of things, you'll become much more resilient. So, and even this big kind of trawler fishing, it's something like seen calories of energy for one, it's really inefficient. And both of these farming types have a really negative effect on the ecosystem itself. They degrade the very thing that they rely on. This is degrading the soil. This is degrading the ocean ecosystems. So we can't have food systems that are polluting and expect to be able to grow and grow them. We've got to what this kind of subsistence system and then innovate and invest in finding out how do we optimize this? How do we make it better? How do we bring our polycultures, our permaculture thinking to really revolutionize this? And I'm told that a good farmer can feed five, six people, maybe 10 people if, they, if they're good at it. And maybe through collaboration and through kind of smart systems, we can produce a lot more food this way and in a way which isn't destroying soils and isn't destroying aquatic um, But <clears throat> what is clear is that to have really sustainable food production systems, a, a great many of us are going to have to get involved in those processes. We're not going to have industry. We're going to all have to give up some of our time each day to composting, cultivating, weeding, watering, planting, hoeing, you know, maintaining food systems. <clears throat> but if those systems are well designed, maybe it's only an hour a day hour and a half a day, depending on your, you know, your, 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 your priorities and your um, abilities. But I think in our permaculture world, we're all going to have a hand in local. From that, we gain well, confidence and security, but also we gain knowledge and, 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 and we can and, and have a much more certainty about where our food is coming from. So, and here's a graph um, published in, 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 in about 10 years ago, in which it's exploring the relationship globally between the price of oil and the price of food. What, it, what we're seeing here is, you know, goes up and down. The price of food is, responds very closely to it. And that's because our food systems actually are so dependent on chemicals and so forth, natural gas for fertilizer. So um, that's the energy return on investment of food. And I'm going to just spend a little bit of time now going into because We've had about um, an hour and 20. 
We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll do a little bit more. Energy of oil. So they measure oil in barrels. I think a barrel of oil is 40 gallons. So to build an oil well, you've got to have machinery, drilling derricks, and you know, energy. Um, but you're obviously going to get a lot back as well. So what's that relationship between how much infrastructure, how much drilling, how much you know investment do we need to make? extract oil. Well, over time, that has changed. And what we're looking at here is a picture of one of the first really big uh, oil wells in Texas. This is called um, Spinter in Texas. And um, <clears throat> you can see lots of drilling derricks all close together. There's a massive dome of oil uh, in the ground there. And yet when they first drilled down, it would spurt out under its own pressure. So all you have to cap the, the, the oil well, put a pipe on it, send it to the refinery. So a hundred years ago, in the early days of oil, the oil industry, it cost one barrel to extract a hundred. So what a great business to be in. For every one dollar you spend, you get ninety nine back. But think of it in terms of energy, more than in terms of money. Actually, energy is real, and uh, money isn't. Money's made up. So money's money's like measuring something with a, an elastic band, the rubber band. Um, <clears throat> so think about it. how many barrels of oil in to how many. What it says here, right back at the real. Beginning of the sort of peak, the first oil rush times, was somewhere between 180 to 1 return. Now that's a great business model. And that's why the whole world got, you know, was a rush for oil. It was something like this is, you've got this incredibly dense form of energy that flows because it's a liquid. And we can now divine, design, also create all sorts of machines, internal combustion engine, cars and planes and trucks and all those things that we didn't have before. The whole possibility of a globalized economy becomes when you have an abundant, cheap, very dense, liquid form of energy, just fantastic. But of course, if we look at the production graph for Texas oil, between 1935 and 2005, 70 years, a so last long time, but look how it went up and up and up and up and up and up, and then it went down a bit, and then they obviously invested a whole lot more and put some more drilling th uh, things in, and up and up and up and up. And somehow, 74, 75, it reached a peak. The pressure of the oil in the ground went right down. The easy stuff that bubbled up to the surface is now gone, and we've got to do a lot more work to get it out. Out. The production goes down, but the amount of work to extract it actually goes up. So that energy return on investment coefficient drops off really quickly. Now, <clears throat> easy to access deposits of oil on land. Um, are being exploited. Some of them are completely gone or they're now, you know, they're not very productive anymore. So certainly, certainly in the UK and the North Sea and slowly, slowly the oil companies have learned to firstly have to drill down the shallow on the continental shelf. And they've actually had to come up with either really super deep oil rigs with, with massive structures or even ones that float in the sea. This is a completely different um, prospect, a completely different thing than this picture on land, close to maybe where the refineries are, um, you know. 
Um, e relatively easy to extract, 100 to 1, 80 to 1 profitability. Um, and now instead, as soon as we go off, it, into the, it drops to maybe 15 to 1, 20 to 1, um, it starts going down. You know, so, some of the oil wells that we're now developing are drilling down, going down through maybe two miles of sea and a mile pile of rock, a, a relatively small reserve of oil. So the, the, the intensity, the energy, the investment is going up and up and up, and the return is starting to go down. Um, <clears throat> all these producer countries like the United Kingdom and Norway in these examples, or in Denmark as well, we can see is they follow a similar sort of curve that it rapidly grows, it sort of flattens off at the top, and then it drops to a, a bell curve, so it's shaped like a bell. And um, once that production starts to fall, it almost doesn't matter how many more wells you, dev you sink, because as the pressure goes away, um, you have to do more and more work to get less and less back. That's what we mean by peak oil. There's a diminishing return that sets in. And slowly that's happening in more places and it's becoming more of an issue. Um, you might have heard about oil sands and tar sands. It's an destructive way of extracting oil that, had, that has an even lower profitability and requires an ever higher oil price for that to actually be able to come to market. So there's a, there's a, um, stop there for a sec. Um, so th this is, there's a, there's a long-term background trend, and this is what David Holmgren was, was, was uh, implying, is that, yeah, the oil isn't going to run out, but to access the remaining price, you know, the producers need to hire the price to be higher and higher. Businesses, the economy, consumers, people like us, we need the price to be lower. So there's a there's a real standoff, and if the price goes too high and the people can't afford it, the market collapses. So there's a very powerful interplay between this diminishing returns on investment for oil and for the onset of climate change. The energy return on investment for different forms of energy um, put on a graph um, might look something like this. So here's our historic oil and gas fields. Here's our our tech Saudi Arabian oil that costs almost nothing to get out of the ground, a few dollars, two, three, four, five, six, seven dollars a barrel to extract, we can sell it for, for much, much higher. It's a 99% profit. But look, the oil and gas fields are ever lower. So here we are, we're seeing at 22, 20, 18, 16, um, new oil and gas fields currently in development actually have a, provide a less energy return on investment large scale wind farms and from well placed solar photovoltaic sites. Renewable energy is directly competing now with fossil fuels. That's a good thing. But there's challenges in that is Fossil fuels are obviously renewable energy electricity. And there's lots of our infrastructure that runs on diesel and petrol. So it's not like for like. But if we move on to a more electric economy, think of the things that we might not be able to continue to do. Think how that might change. We've got biofuels on here. It's interesting to see that sugarcane ethanol um, that's biofuels grown in the tropics, grown on an equator, maybe somewhere like Brazil. Give 10 or 8 
energy return on investment. It's, 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 it's a borderline, but it's, it's just about worth doing. That equates to the energy return on investment for nuclear. Now, this, I think this needs checking out this fact. And I think that would be a contentious. It depends on how you measure the energy return on investment for nuclear, because when it goes wrong, it takes vast amount of energy to try and fix it. Think Fukushima, you know, think Chernobyl. And also think of um, nuclear waste needs to be stored for tens of thousands of years. How are we going to do that? Um, so it, it, you, the, 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 uh, there's different kinds of nuclear, there's fusion and fission. Fusion would be a really good good thing 30 years away because it's it, we haven't managed to science hasn't managed to resolve some of the technical problems yet and to solve that and then create a, a, a commercial forms and then scale it up globally that's going to take decades and that's why the Paris is over three decades is we're not going to do this overnight it's a transition and look temperate biofuels that's us in the temperate clone zones trying to grow fuels to energy. It's not going to work. They just, it's too slow. It's not profitable enough. So it looks to me that wind and solar are going to win out by far. And they're going to be our main transition fuels plus organic methods. And that's why permaculture has so much to offer. And that's why we are, um, yeah, we need to understand our role within this global transition away from fossil fuels. So this is about um, uh, biofuels. And the number one plant that's been grown as an energy crop, i.e. not for food, it's maize. And I, I see a problem with that because maize is a very, very important food crop. If we start using food crops as energy crops, is that's your food going into the, the tank of someone else's lorry. And what we're seeing that as the world has invested more in biofuels, um, the price of corn and the price of oil are becoming tied. This is not good news. This is another trend. And um, so here's the US figures for um, domestic corn use. And look how production has risen from 5 billion bushels to about 12 billion bushels. So we've seen more than a doubling. But the amount available for food has stayed exactly the same. And of that du doubling, um, it's increasingly used for industrial uses and for making alcohol to, to be mixed into petrol to, so that we have, we can carry on driving our cars. We should, alarm bells should be ringing ringing when we're diverting essential foods to become energy crops. This is going to become a bigger challenge. And here's the US Corn Belt. Um, this is what maize monoculture looks like on a vast scale. There's no nature. I don't see a single tree. I see no habitat. Where are the birds supposed to nest? Um, where, 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 how are migrating animals supposed to move through this landscape? This is a disaster for biodiversity, and therefore it's a disaster for soil quality, and ultimately it's a disaster for these farmers. They're going to become more and more dependent on industrial inputs to maintain their farming systems, which means their energy return on investment in terms of the energy in as a farmer, so the value of the crop, it goes down. It's not sustainable. Clearly, this is not sustainable. Uh, I put this little picture in 
but just to think about the exact opposite of what that system might look like to what our mandala permaculture gardens might look like where we might create um enormous amounts of productivity but never in a monoculture system and maybe designed around people rather than machines uh again this slideshow is available to download on the website so you can you're welcome to explore it in more detail but i'm trying to collect these ideas together to kind of give us a you know a, a uh, a contrast. Um, yeah, lots of books came out in the late 2007, 8, 9, 10 period on the subject of peak oil. And um, there was a real fascination at the time with how this inflection point it came about 2008 when global production started to fall. But of course, what has happened is, well, here's the scenario, but if you like, but what has happened is global production of what we call conventional crude oil, the stuff that we've, uh, that the world's been running on for the last century, that started to reach its peak about 2008, 9, 10, um, depending on how you measure it, depending on the price of oil, quite a few variables, but it started to peak around then. And we, but the world has now filled the gets something to try and fill the gap with new fields that are inferior, the new fields that we have, you know, we start to look for, we haven't found yet. We know that there's going to be a limit to that. We can't keep expanding oil production. If we want to see where potential lies, it's in condensed natural gas and then these shale oils and tight oils. But look, all of these involve enormous amounts of investment and all of those bring us into the brown tech quadrant of the future scenarios. This is a world that gets ever dirtier, ever nastier, ever more um, uh, uh, authoritarian and in which we the people are more and more suppressed. Just so we can continue using the same um, you know, processes that we have been. And, and that's what we have to get out of. And we've seen huge volatil volatility in the oil world, oil price of late, and that's gonna keep happening. And um, yeah, there's a lot of things we can, we can explore in this. Um, so we're filling the gap with, 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 and you see US oil production has actually gone up a lot in recent years. How have they achieved that? Well, they've done that through fracking and these um, active extraction methods, which increase the environmental cost, increase the production cost, increase the, you know, the damage that's been caused. And it's only just keeping us going at current rates. It doesn't open up new possibilities. So folks, the end of all of this is, the summary of this is, we have to understand we're at the end of the era of cheap energy. It's not just going to just go away. Um, and if the price remains high, that there'll, there'll, there'll still be a petro uh, a, a, or you know, a, a fossil fuel supplies will keep coming. But as soon as we can't afford that, or the climate problem kicks in strong enough, then you know we're brought we're, we're brought to a situation where situ we are brought to a situation where we're forced to change and to contemplate change. That's why we have permaculture. That's why we're here to discuss that with you here now. And yeah, I'm going to just take a pause and um, suggest that we take a break. Yeah, sure. Um... Let's take a 10, a 10 minutes break. I don't know, should it be shorter? Steve, you take No, it will not be shorter. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's take a 10 minutes break and then be back at uh, 20 past the hour for our last segment. Thanks, Steve. That's, you know, 
uh, lot, uh, that was really informative and lots of information in there. Eye opening. All right, see you in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Uh, hello, Mr. Gerard. Yes, Simon, how are you? Yeah, January, this is January. Oh, January, how are you? Sorry. I'm good, I'm good, sir. So, uh, you're doing today? good? No, okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, I'm doing good here. I hope you're enjoying the sessions. Yeah, I'm enjoying the session, but uh, I was late. Ah, no worries. I you... was late, that's why yeah. I would like to know more about what you started from. No, the beauty with it is, uh, uh, do you, what, once it ends, like tomorrow, you can check the YouTube. Or, YouTube, wow, wow, yeah. thanks. Because it's, it's both recorded and mm. then it's also streaming live on uh, YouTube. Yeah. So you can just go to the YouTube and check it. Otherwise, I don't know at what point you came in. Yeah, that should be, that should be fantastic. Yeah, sure. Just check the YouTube. Yeah, we do it. All, well, all, I, I, since I started to ask you your WhatsApp number, but you haven't sent to me. Oh, okay. I will, I will text it. I will text it to you. Yeah, that should be excellent. I will put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay? Okay. All right, January. Let's uh, meet up in about eight minutes now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I will I'll take a cup of tea. Yeah.
you know, and of course, um, yeah, just welcome back. Uh, just slowly get ready to start again next minute or so or two. Um, I'm just looking at this fund here, the this Ashton Fund Climate Solutions in Action. That obviously the, the, there's there's incentives out there in the world now um, for you know encouraging us all to be moving in these directions, um, understanding, responding to, to the climate crisis, and and um, yeah, this is so to a certain extent this represents opportunities too. Although this is such a severe and huge challenge. Um, yeah, and in this point of the lecture, I slipped in my um, <laughs> permaculture design course <laughs> advert, as in, that's why we're doing this, it's because we're in a very real situation. Um, and whether we're concerned about the big global picture or not is these, this this should frame our own actions and our own understanding. And I think that's what's so, so, so important. So look, I'm going to try and squeeze in this next section because this is very key. Um, this is the good news side of the story is we've got to move to sustainable energy systems. And there are all sorts of opportunities for energy generation. And we can do it on different scales. And quite often it's you good to collaborate and so energy uh community energy schemes can be very important this of course is um the a pelton wheel from a hydro hydroelectric system and you can see these little cups where a, a jet of water would be directed at it and then they obviously spin and if you rotate magnets in front of a copper coil you induct, induce uh, an electronic current. So we can use the energy of water to spin things. And if we can spin something, we can make electricity. So if we can spin something we, we, uh, using the wind, it's a wind turbine. If we're spinning something using uh, water pressure, then it's a water turbine. Um, if we are spinning something using the heat, the the, 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 the uh, steam pressure, um, then it's a steam turbine. And that steam pressure might come from, so when we talk about high, um, nuclear power, nuclear power is only boiling water to spin a turbine. It's not anything different. As uh, I think Einstein said, that's one hell of a way to boil water. We don't necessarily need to do really risky things to make things spin around. We can make electricity from lots of different ways. And of course, we now have the whole solar photovoltaic. In fact, there's two ways of doing solar power. Anyway, I'm gonna, I get ahead of myself. Um, to work out the potential of a hydro system, of how much energy is there in water? How much energy could I extract usefully to use as uh, <clears throat> to generate electricity? Um, and so there's a simple formula is that available power is going to be a relationship between the height that the water is falling and the volume of the water. So we could come to the, um, and obviously it's never going to be 100% efficiency, 100% efficient, because there's always friction, remember? So there's always an energy loss when we transfer energy from one form to another. So in hydropower, we talk about the head and the flow. The head is the, distance in meters that the water falls and the flow is the rate in meters cubed per second of the volume of the water and <clears throat> if we had a let's say a 60 percent efficient uh, hydro turbine 
we could then work out exactly the um the potential in our river so the uh we always multiply by so it's the head meaning the height the flow the rate of uh in liters per second times gravity gravity is 9.8 so if we could do it in our head we could just say 10. so it's height times flow times gravity and then there's an efficiency coefficient because we're never going to convert all of that into electricity there's going to be some waste as heat um, so we could work out in the kilowatt in, in uh, um, the power of the end of yeah, how much electricity we can generate through a very simple calculation and um, hydro can be done in a way in which it's very high impact and very expensive huge dams like the Aswan dam like the Kariba dam like the Hoover dam that have dams across whole rivers They're hugely expensive I think the dam in the Congo now that of course there's a big dam at uh, Bujigali in Uganda these are very very expensive installations and they have a very big um ecological impact and if you dam a river we talked about this in uh previous sessions is the water that's flowing that's carrying silt isn't going to deposit that silt and slowly slowly the upstream is going to silt up um i think these are uh, huge dams are a terrible mistake i'm a big fan of hydropower but i think we should be thinking about it in lots of small scale installation installations rather than single really big ones there's also there's an energy in energy out relationship and there's a lot of energy gone in into constructing and maintaining infrastructure like dams so let's let's although hydro is important let's understand that there's kind of good hydro and bad hydro and i think in this picture we're looking at a bad hydro example because it's closed off the river it's stopped the river from performing its ecosystems functions um how can fish now swim up the river to spawn it's, it's interrupted the natural flow of things what is much more interesting and full of potential is what we call micro hydro small scale hydro that takes let's have a look here's our river coming out of the mountains coming downhill there's flow there's gravity in here there's there's there's, there's potential energy and what we can do is take some of the flow of the river maybe 20 percent of the flow of the river so the river still functions as an ecosystem and still continues but we can take some of the water away hold it in a four bay and then drop it down the straightest furthest the, the, the greatest height in the straightest line so it's the minimum amount of friction and remember that when you if you were to be building a hydro system is you're putting a lot of infrastructure in there you're, you're spending some money so you want to have the right infrastructure in the right place you need to understand the flow of the water and therefore have a turbine that's the right specification in relationship to the flow that you have you need to understand the peak flow uh, when the river's really full and the minimum flow when in the river's really dry and understand you might not be able to take power out all year round because you can't the, the actual flow in the channel is more important than what you're extracting but at the end of the day is all you're doing is taking some of the flow diverting it by the straightest route possible so you can extract the energy at the lowest point and then return it back to the system again so in the grand scheme of things the, the river is un hindered by the process and then now we have our electricity coming out and that can run to our community our factory whatever it is we need that energy for so understand the difference between 
Um, understand that you can see the potential for hydro energy is a multiplication of head and flow. So if, if we have a very big river with a lot of flow, then we don't need much head or fall. Um, and if we have a small river, but with, a, with, with very rapid flow, that can, could potentially generate an equal amount of energy. Okay, so here's our micro hydro. This is, and again, these, these systems are site specific. If you haven't got that potential, you haven't got that potential. But in, certainly in mountainous countries, in Nepal and Bhutan, for example, and parts of Ethiopia, there's an enormous um, potential for small scale hydro. And um, it can also help with flood management and by, by diverting some of the runoff of when we get you know, storm surges. And this can be part of our solution, but it's not the only, it's, it, we, our lesson for working with renewable energy is that we have to combine together a range of different technologies. We can't just, and we can only use those ones that are obviously that are the, that give us the best energy return on investment for our locality. So if you haven't got the right kind of river, the right kind of flow or fall, you can't do hydro. If you haven't got the, you know, enough sun, um, or too shaded or you're too far north, maybe solar isn't for you, but there'll be an option. Um, so big rivers with a lot of flow can take, have different kinds of hydro turbines in. This is an Archimedes screw type. And again, this, yeah, this, 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 this might suit a different set of conditions than this previous example. So again, it's about understanding the size, the rate, the flow of the energy that's available, and then designing a system that can harvest that energy in the most efficient way. And also in relation to the energy that you need, there's no point in generating power you don't need. Um, so we can match again the system that we build to the load or to the you know to the requirement that we have. Um, now I said to you, um, there are certain things that are going to be very hard to do with electricity. So we can to generate electricity from solar, from hydro, from wind. Um, but what's it going to be like for transport? And um, I think that this is this is an interesting graph to explore. And, and I won't take too long on it, but it, it is actually super interesting. And I, I've been looking at this, coming back to this. So this is a work of um, someone within the Post Carbon Institute who's looking at the long term implications of our move away from fossil fuels. And this fact that 99% of all of our transport is petrol and diesel. And, and that's because as soon as you've got a moving thing like a car is you want a very dense form of fuel, don't you? You don't want um, if you're, uh, so that you've got room for passengers. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, they did have coal powered ships at one stage, but this half of the load of the ship was the coal. So that's what I mean by the denser the fuel, the more useful it becomes. Anyway, so there's many forms of transport. And this graph explores the relationship between energy efficiency and speed. So that's kind of interesting. So if you're thinking about transport is, yeah, we want to get somewhere quickly. That's good, isn't it? A form of transport that's quick is good, gets us there. But the that might make it very expensive. So it's, and 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 what we seem to learn is if a slow, large form of transport is quite cheap, but it takes a long time, and a small, fast form of transport is expensive but is very convenient. So we've got a trade-off. And and in this graph, there's a kind of an argument, again, an opinion. But this dotted line is saying that anything to the right of this dotted line we're going to struggle ever harder to afford. It's not efficient enough. 
No, it's the other way around. Sorry, it's everything to the left. The stuff on the right is 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 um will remain desirable for longer. So look here. Freight, that's carrying stuff around that um oil tankers, big trains, big container ships, they're slow, but the energy cost is low. So, okay, they're looking at speeds here that come, look, the speeds go that way and the energy costs go that way. So something that's slow and cheap would be an oil tanker, a big train or a container ship. Even an oil pipeline is not fast enough to really be sustainable. Um, gas pipelines, absolutely borderline. Large trucks, depending on the terrain. Um, now, planes, again, this is arguing is, is they're very expensive. So look, they're right up here and the energy cost very high, but they're so useful because they're so fast. So what we might find is propeller planes, jet planes, supersonic planes might continue into the future but they're going to be really expensive. So, and, and the reason that we'll continue with them is because they're just so damn useful. Um, but we're not going to be flying around for pleasure and leisure on holidays into the rate to which the world currently is. And what's so interesting to me, this is that uh, passenger trains, buses, cars, do not perform well. And in fact, if we balance energy efficiency with speed, the car is the least efficient form of transport. That's what this graph tells us. And that means that cars don't have a great future. And it means that it's probably not the thing that we need to keep investing in. It seems like we could innovate with bicycles to make them better. Um, because they have a certain energy cost, but they're also very slow. So they're not very desirable. But can we invest and innovate? Because I think bicycles have a big part to play. Um, and it looks like trains have a potential. Um, but otherwise, passenger transport. You know, what they're basically what some people are saying is, look, the future is going to be much more local. And the problem with car, cars and buses is you have to not just maintain the car and the bus, but you also have to maintain the road. And roads consume a lot of energy. So transport's going to be a big deal. I, I, for one, I'm interested in floating things. I'm very interested in not so much planes, but in airships. And I think that as we move away from the oil age, we'll start getting much will begin to innovate have new ideas in new directions and that's what i want to encourage not to give a doom and gloom message but to to make us understand is um yeah this is this is where we need to innovate so here's some here's some um here's some thoughts around warm air rises and we talked about catch and store energy now if we're interested in heat we what we're interested in is containing heat how do we hold on to heat and the answer is with thermal mass if we heat up something that has a, a a density to it it takes a long time to heat up but it holds that heat for a long time too this is our secret to working with heat so if um looked around a few aspects of the energy issue here and then i'm moving towards um, the idea of heating things up and also cooling things down using thermal mass. This is really efficient way of doing things. And I think this is our, in, this is our window into the future. And this is something which we're very, very interested in, in permaculture. And I would like to expound on, um, so <clears throat> actually a lot of the energy we use in the home, these figures are from the West, but it's, it's about heat um and sometimes we get really 
obsessed with either talking about fossil fuels or talking about electricity um, when we're talking about energy. Well, actually, a very large part of what we use is for cooking, for either heating space up because it's cold or, or cooling a space down because it's too hot. And we can do these things very differently. And that's where our opportunities lie. And this is where in that permaculture, we're looking at these types of solutions. So this is in Australia, and this is a massive termite mound. And, you know, fundamental question, there you go, is what is that structure? Why has the termites gone to all of the effort of building that huge thing? And why is it so big? Um, and um, where do the termites live? Are, are they, you know, in relation to this structure? And of course, the truth of it is, this is a thermal chimney. The termites build this structure. So, and the hotter the climate, this is Australia, it gets very, very hot. So they built this enormous um, termite nest. So it takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. So the internal temperature where the termites actually are and where their uh, nests are stays the same it might be 40 plus, you know centigrade in the daytime and it might go down to zero at night time what the termites do is during the daytime they unplug these um, sub these um Um, they plug up these subterranean passages so and um, this will heat up and warm air will rise off it and as as the temperature of the block increases the termites can open up and allow air to infiltrate in that's come through the ground they built these tunnels so that the air is cooled by the soils and as it comes up and evaporates through the warmer air rises warm air expands so as the cool air from the ground rises into the higher part of the termites nest it expands and it rises and it takes away the urea takes away the carbon dioxide it ventilates the termites nest so hang on a minute these termites can maintain the internal nest night and day so it stays exactly the same and the temperature is varying maybe by 40 degrees centigrade in a day there's our model there's the template from nature that we can learn from this is using thermal mass to both to maintain temperatures we could build buildings like this we can learn from these ideas and adapt them and that is the cutting edge of um of design so here we are seeing the chambers within the um, within the termites nest and also also seeing that they're growing fungus um, which they could eat and there's different vents as well and ventilation shafts which can be opened and closed by the termites so the hotter the day is the more they want to vent heat out and then at the night time when it starts to get cold they want to close these channels off so then the heat that's trapped inside the mass of the termite mound radiates now back into the middle and maintains the heat currently. We learn the lessons here by observing nature. Nature's our teacher. This is what we're interested in permaculture. So we can build and design buildings where we, if we know of the sun, um, in the winter, we might want a passive gain. We want to let more heat in. And in the summer, we want to exclude the heat. So here in our temperate climate, um, in the summer, the sun is higher in the sky and in the sky. So we could design buildings that let the winter sun in, but exclude the summer sun. Or let the winter sun in to a thermally massive wall, which heats up the building, or let the sun sun in, but onto a part of the building that doesn't heat. 
we can design buildings to absorb and to vent heat according to our requirements. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a building um, at the Centre for Alternology. This is in Machenkleth in Wales, where I used to work. And this is a passive solar building. Um, you'll notice that these are internal walls and they are made from rammed earth. No cement, just sand vibrated and compressed in a form and then done layer after layer. That's why you see these sort of almost geological strata. And then this is a thermally massive wall. This dense class tons. It's been constructed on site using local materials that we didn't have to transport. And it's designed so that in the winter, the low slanting light shines in onto the wall and the wall absorb that heat. Slowly, slowly, slowly heat up during the day. Slowly, slowly, slowly release that heat during the night. So that the average temperature in the build same. So this is it, learning from nature learning from the termites nest how to use the sun and thermal mass and the the fact that air warm air rises we can predict air flows so that we can regulate the temperature inside buildings with quite simple design techniques now our ancestors knew this and there's lots of traditional designs that are very fur thermally efficient but modern buildings often are not they're built out of cement with tin really heat up like a cooker during the day and they go really cold at night. When we work with natural materials, it's much softer and we get these edge effects of slowly heating and slowly cooling, which is exactly what we want. So imagine designing buildings with this in mind. And I, I, I'd love to take some of these ideas and trial them out in, in, in Uganda. Um, but let's put a different example. So both kind of say the same kind of thing, but is, let's look at it this one. Let's look, let's look at this building. This is a big, modern, shiny building. But, you can, and, 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 but these ideas could be translated to, to anything of any scale. We have the sunny side of the building. There's a solar chimney on top of the building that's just functioning exactly like the termite's nest. Okay, so when the sun shines onto this, this sun, it's going to warm the air and that air is going to rise and leave the building out of the vent. On this sunny side of the building, we have lots of plants growing. And the plants humidify the air and reduce the amount of heat coming into the building. And if, if air is leaving, warm air is leaving here at the top, that's going to create suction, isn't it? And if we've designed our building very cleverly, we can choose then, warm air is leaving, we can run air with cool air entering from the shady side of the building. Maybe we make that air flow over water or th through trees, which is cooled by a degree or two. The Iranian chamber, which again, a little bit cooler. And then that air is then gently drawn into the building by the convection current of the warm air leaving. We can even use plants inside the building to modify the climate effect to humidify the air to make it more comfortable. Nobody, it's not nice to sit in direct sun, is it? So think about how this building might respond to changes in temperature during the day and how um, in an evening when the sun goes down, you might want to retain some heat. You can then just close these vents and prevent the flow of cool air into the building and just think about how that might, those ideas could be incorporated into designs. Simple fact that warm air rises and will draw in 
cooler air, cooler air, if it's especially if it's humidified, can have a cooling effect on the in, internal climate of the whole building. Now, with traditional mud hut designs, you've got thermally massive walls. It gives you the potential to convection currents and to manage the flow of air through the system. I think we should be experimenting with that. And I think we could create very comfortable, more climate resilient housing for ourselves and maybe for animals by just understanding these techniques a little bit better. I'm no architect, I'm no builder. But what I'm interested in is the pattern. And what we're seeing is what we understand is, look, there's a, there's a constant here. So as much as water will always end up at the bottom of the hill, warm air will rise. And when warm air rises, we can make predictions and we can design around that. Okay. Um, so you're just going to stick in the time. We've got 40 minutes. Okay, great. Um, this, again, is a, this is, I guess, is a more Western interpretation, but this is interesting. This is um, someone that we knew who des designed a building and he was trying to think about building for cool, temperate climate. So it has to be waterproof, it has to be warm, um, it has to be well insulated. Um, but made from local and natural materials. This is actually made for shape of it, it's made from straw bales, made from the fibers left from uh, wheat farming that have been dried and compressed. So think about um, structural approaches to building that, inc that impressed dry vegetable matter. You could grow the materials that you build out of, compress them into bricks. You can cover the outside with clay and then render that with lime. And you now have a breathable but waterproof skin to your building. Uh, you can build up earth and plants on the roof to add it for insulation. And you can bring in thermal mass um, so that where you're cooking or any heat you create stays inside and, 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 and this is a very very well insulated building which means warm air generated inside tends to stay there or if it's very cold outside the cold doesn't penetrate of course the opposite is also true if it's really hot outside it stays cool inside Creativity, creativity, wonderful to see. Now, the thing, the bit of the lecture I most want to dwell on, and I, to me is the most important, is we, we, we already talked a little bit about combustion. Um, but coming back, thinking about warm air rises and thermal mass. And I want to get back to this very, very important thing about um, efficient combustion. And we're going to talk about cooking. And and I want to get into talking about very energy efficient ways of cooking and, and, and there's on the knock on effects that that might have. And that sits very much within this idea of thermal mass. Look, these are traditional cookers, uh, ovens. Um, here that one's from Scotland. Uh, I saw this one in Portugal. Um, look, it's made out of a lot of stone. So imagine if you have a fire inside this oven, that the heat from that is going to be soaked up by these stones. So we're going to end up with um, it's going to what you might it's going to stay hot for a long time, which is what you want for a cooker. So we're seeing thermal mass there. This 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 principle um, inside it's specially shaped so that it's it's actually dome shaped. It's got a flat floor and a domed wall and you can see the ashes inside there and then you can see it burning and what's happening is we've got a fire inside a chamber so as the fire gets hotter as the fire burns it draws in air from the outside so here's air coming in from the outside just, just about to see that being drawn into the combustion chamber inside that chamber inside there um 
where obviously uh, to make a fire blow hotter you blow you blow on it to make a fire burn hotter you blow on it <sighs> like that <clears throat> we'll give it more oxygen so this this fire is sucking in air over the coals which makes them burn burn, burn hotter it then hits the back of the the back wall of the oven here and the only way that it can leave is by going up and out over the dome, which is a longer distance. It's coming in straight and leaving in a big long curve. So the air leaving the furnace is leaving faster than the air coming into it, which creates suction, which makes the fire suck in more air faster. So it rockets, it feeds back on itself and the faster, the more it sucks the air, the hotter the coals burn, the hotter the other, the more efficient the combustion, the, the hotter the oven is, and then that, that process repeats itself. So our ancestors have been building these kind of ovens for, for as long as they've, I don't know, for millennia. Um, and we can learn from that. We can make models. We can explore, we can come up with maybe a more efficient ways of combusting. And that's something that um, I've been playing with for a while. And it's this rocketing effect that we've got very interested in. So um, here's a design that, that's been prototyped here in the West where you have a fire in a tube. So a little bit like in the oven, you've got a fire in a composed, com in a, in a confined space. So as it burns, the air expands and leaves. And then in this instance, there's a bigger chamber here um, so that the air, the expanding air can move into that, which creates the suction behind it. And this is highly insulated to maintain, to be, we want the combustion to be as hot as possible. And then, when the flu gases mix with air, we get really good combustion in the secondary chamber. Um, this is wood gas. So um, we've, we talked about this in the biochar uh, lecture, that if we heat up wood, we heat up our wood fuel, actually two things happen is the wood fuel turns black. Let's go back to this. So we've all seen a match. Let's just think about what happens when you strike a match. Let's understand the process of combustion in wood. Okay. And because we want to do this very, very efficiently, we want to just understand it a little bit in more detail. So how does a match light? Well, it's a chemical reaction that it starts. It's got some phosphorus or it's got some chemical on the end of the match, hasn't it? That when you add friction, you put it on the striker, the chemicals in the, uh, in the head of the match are agitated and they release heat. And then that's enough to begin the combustion of the match. And the heat makes the match give off its volatile gases. And the, if the fuel is the match, What's coming off it is hydrogen, methane, uh, sorry, um, yeah, hydrogen, which is flammable, methane, which is flammable, and oils in a vapor, tar, which is also flammable. And then you'll notice that as that, uh, that, those gases come off, they burn with an orange flame. As they mix with air, they burn with an orange flame. And you also watch the match itself shrinks and goes black, doesn't it? And then eventually, and that's the, the wood turning to charcoal, to char. And, and if you allow it, that char will also burn potentially. So there's two stages of combustion to wood. There's the gas part and the charring part. And what we don't want to do is to heat up the fuel and lose the gases because that's most of the energy available to us in the wood. So when we burn wood, we want to have a controlled burn. Otherwise, we barely get 20% of the potential energy. As soon as we can control it in an oven, 
in a container. We, we're absorbing the heat, we're accelerating the combustion, we're optimizing the combustion. Then we suddenly jump from 20% efficiency to 90, 95% efficiency. And the amount of heat we produce and the amount of usable energy we produce is, it's really staggering. So the difference between balancing a pot on three stones to cook and actually making wood gas efficiently might be that you reduce the amount of wood you use by 80%. Uh, we had a student, um, a learner with us in um, who'd switched to using a Lorena stove, which is what we're going to talk about next, an energy efficient stove. She said she used to buy a bundle of sticks for 4,000 shillings and it would last her one week. And she said once she changed to the stove, it lasted her a month, four times as long. And she achieved that by having a controlled burn using air controlled air flows and thermal mass so this is how we begin here's some friends of mine they've been playing around with wood gasification for a while creating different stoves and burners that um run on wood gas and retain the charcoal which we can use as, for, as biochar in in farming but um, there's ancient versions of this going back um, some centuries and modern high-tech versions now coming onto the market here in the West. But what we're interested in, especially in the permaculture side of things is, okay, these high-tech things are great, but is what can we build out of local and natural materials? Remember, that's our theme. We want to we want to understand how energy sits within the local and natural materials. Can we create um, um, ways of um, combusting that are significantly more efficient? And the answer to that is yes, we can. And this is what it looks like. And um, you may be familiar with this. You may not, um, but let's have a look at the, the Lorena stuff. And, and what we also need to do is to look at our dear colleagues in Tapa, uh, Simon, and, and that's you with, with, with Deborah. Um, so not in that picture, but that, um, this form of combustion let's see oh um okay sorry i was wanna I've, I've i've been building this web page to go with the lesson as as, we, as i've been teaching it's got to make a little change to it um but really, I want Deborah to lead on this, and I want you guys who've been working with these to talk about this from your first-hand experience. I just want to relate this to um, uh, to the theory of what we've just been talking about, which is um, accelerated combustion and 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 um, using thermal mass. So here we see pictures of people making the stove is made from clay and sand. Clay can come from a termite mound, sand you'll find locally. Um, the diameters are, are formed around the pots that you're using and the fuel that you're intending to use. And we're creating a, a, a mud block with lots of thermal mass that has a hole down the middle. Often people do that with, um, construct that by forming the block around the stalk of a banana, and then you can paint that in cooking oil so that the, um, the, the clay doesn't stick to it. And you can slide it out, and now you've got a clay block with a channel down the middle. And you can cut pots, uh, uh, cut around your cooking pots for your cooking areas, and you can construct 
the chimney, the flue gas exhaust. And this technology is going to save, is reduce, will reduce your wood consumption easily by 80%. But not only that, it will eliminate smoke. And the inhalation of smoke is one of the single worst things you can do for your chest. I think it's the biggest cause of preventable disease in the majority world. It's cooking on smoky fires. So look, this is good for your health. This is energy efficient and it's, um, it makes cooking a whole different experience. And um, here we see, this is um, us in Rwanda, um, this time last year. And there's our banana stalk and we've got our clay base to the stove and we're working out the, the size of the chimney and, and, and so forth. And then building up the layers of clay forming around the, 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 the formers. And then um, there's the chimney coming. And there's it in action. And what, what, what we, Gerald and I have, uh, and the others who've worked with this, it has seen is how adaptable this design is, that people can, once you've got the concept of it, you can make it fit in your kitchen. You can have your, you know, you can exhaust the flue gases to the outside. Um, you can come up with, we can create a cooking environment. that's clean, healthy, and really much more energy efficient. So I'm, I'm going to um, see what else we've got on the page. Um, so. I, I'm going to add some more resources onto this week's page about the Lorena stove. And I also think that I would like, I would strongly feel that we need some leadership from those of you who've been working with these in your communities, because I know it's been transforming uh, to where people have adopted this. And the other thing I just put in into today's lecture is on the, on the subject of using and value natural resources and services is the bio sand filter, which is a way of cleaning dirty water by using just biology and sand to create potable drinking water. And I think, I think we need to ex um, enlarge on that if we haven't already, but I'm going to pause now because I feel like we've, we've touched on a lot of things today and I'd, I'd like to hear some thoughts back or questions or, or reflections. So we'll stop there, but I can add, I will add more resources to this page later on. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, Steve. And uh, that is, you know, especially when it comes to the <clears throat> last bit. So anyway, the whole session and uh, then the energy aspect of it this is something that speaks directly to each and every one of us and caroline and all those that are working uh more with ladies and from an african perspective you know the hustle and hurdles uh, women go through to look for the firewood and other than looking for the firewood alone, so that is the first maybe entry point. But we know also the damage it all causes, other than the physical energy involved with it, but also the damage that comes with it. If, if anything, most like uh, I last checked, and apparently the highest cause or one of the leading causes of uh, deforestation and loss of forest cover is uh, wo uh, firewood and then uh, charcoal burning, those two. So if there is any intervention, it doesn't only relieve the mothers out there, the burden, but it also creates a healthy environment because like, for instance, the Rorena stove also has the impact that uh, you have less carbon monoxide building up inside your cooking place. 
and additionally you're doing you know less emissions if anything but also on top of that you're not chopping like chopping down the big tree or the fully grown tree for you to use you can pick the little branches or as we go on even you look at things like uh coppicing so that you can grow uh those little uh, you can grow trees, multiply them, pick off the offshoots, and utilize those. Thanks, Steve. I think that's a really key point, Gerald. Is you suddenly with the when you're burning with great efficiency, suddenly really small sticks become useful. You don't need to cut the tree down. You can just thin the branches. You can dry the wood, and actually, yeah. And, and then you realize that you could grow it yourself through careful management, as you said, Gerald, by using coppicing techniques and there's some very fast growing nitrogen fixing types of tree. We've talked about them already that you could be using. So it could be part of your soil building and your energy plan is, you know, comes together with these ideas. Um, maybe, um, most of you know coriandra have you most of you have heard of coriandra and uh, the likes especially coriandra we found it to be really malfunctional it's a fodder is nitrogen fixing fast growing and then you can utilize it both for shed and even the offshoots for your firewood or even coppice it it regenerates and you you have lots of it even for, for the firewood and the fodder. Um, oh, Caroline, you have your hand up. Please feel free to unmute and contribute. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, yes, um, I was uh, looking at the energy options and uh, it has been quite an interesting class, though at some stage uh, the internet let me down, but I managed to come back on. Uh, yes, uh, you know, sources of uh, heat are a problem in Africa, and it's true, they are the major causes of uh, deforestation. Uh, yet again, I went to Paul's place and uh, came out with something called a solar cooker. There was a training there. We were taught how to do a solar oven. And uh, the most interesting thing is that when it's very hot, you can actually cook your meals using sunlight. And uh, when I looked at this, I was like, if every household had a solar oven, it would reduce the use of firewood by about 60%. You know, you'd only use firewood in the evenings or early in the morning. But during the day, if you're in a secure homestead, you'd leave your food out to cook in the sun. And when you come back in the evening, the food is ready, you know? Um, there are also other, uh, okay, here in Kenya, we call them energy jikos. Yeah, we call them energy jikos because they use very little energy. You just need a little bit of firewood and it works so well. So I'm trying to imagine that with the use of the solar and uh, the use of the energy, you call it the Lorena stove. With the use of the Lorena stove, I believe uh, the women's lives would be made much, much easier by, you know, it would just be nice. You know, it would be something very good for the women. We, we, we know, we, we know um, examples of people who've almost made uh, an enterprise out of this, going around communities and helping each household build their stove. It takes, it's like half a day's work and you need a few people because it's quite a lot of work 
to prepare the cob. But once it's done, it will last you for a long time and you can repair it and work with it. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point, Caroline. It's, and this is where really what I'm going with this is I'm interested in how we combine these things together. So the um, you, better use of solar with much better uh, combustion and uh, the people using the L- Lorena stove have, have also said it stays hot for hours. So sometimes they might cook for their children and then the husband comes back later, but it keeps the food hot. They don't have to light the fire a second time. All of these things could multiply together to, as you say, really change people's lives. What a waste of time every day just to be you know, carrying wood for, a, a, you know, spending more and more of your days just searching for and, 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 and collecting that energy. We could sidestep that and then suddenly people are freed up to you know, use their time so much more creatively and usefully. Oh, thanks, Steve. Okay, Simon is coming on. But then I also, as we always say, integrate rather than segregate. If you can combine several of those, and if you have the capacity, uh, you can also look at things like biogas in simple constructions or simple household setups. Before you know it, you can totally eliminate, you know, the use of uh, or even minimize it to less than 10%. Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, Simon, you can unmute. Yes, it is a nice topic that we are in, apparently. But uh, as we had earlier on started on the fuel construction and extraction, there, it, at a certain point, it affects our nature, yet we want nature to be our friend. But through the process of that extraction, uh, the topography where the fuel has been extracted will damage the, the topography of that position. So we as the permaculture designers, we have got a role to refix back the nature of that place where the extraction has taken place. And um, when we bring in the aspect of Lorena so forth, for us here in Eastern region, where Tapa is the pioneer, we have constructed many of them and it has helped series of women whereby they are so happy that it has helped them to reduce on the consumption of firewood and uh, eventually it saves much of their time where a woman can do some bit of work elsewhere as well as monitoring her Lorona stove and so forth and so forth. And it has reduces the risks of most of them getting some diseases that are associated with smoke, more so with those who are majorly victims of asthma. So in fact, the use of Lorena, it would be more cheaper than us going in for the solar, uh, solar, solar kind of stoves because it is a bit expensive for some who cannot afford. But to me, I rather advocate for us to use the local resources that we have available at a particular time. And then in the long run, when finances a bit heightened up, and then we can bring in that aspect of the, the, the solar orbit. Yeah. So let us make the available resources that we have put into practice, and then we see how we can go on. Uh, Lorna stoves is widely used in Eastern region right now through the initiative of uh, our coordinator and the principal, Steve Jones, and the, uh, Deborah, uh, 
uh, Simon. So really, women are happy with that technology, though most of them did not know how it is constructed, but we are making them come to know how to construct it, how to make the best use of those small, small available resources that we have at our local day. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. That is interesting. Caroline has just hinted on another key aspect in the comments. The home becomes peaceful. And obviously, as a, a women advocate, she has the details, and which is true. You have peace, you have is the health aspect, and you're saving the environment. Thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks everyone. That was really an interesting session. Uh, back to you, Steve. Uh, Nicholas and January, do you have any input? Sorry to put you on the spot. January, January was in the chat. Oh. Okay. And was, uh, yeah, very um, keen, um, interested to know more about the, the, the Lorena stove. And I think, yes, you're right. Honestly, Caroline Tapper have done sensational work. They've transformed whole communities there and, and, and set up support groups to, you know, to pass on that knowledge. And um, uh, Deborah is, has, has really impressed us with what she's done. So I'd love to hear, hear firsthand from her uh, yeah, soon. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. It's been uh, another interesting, you know, uh, knowledge packed session, very informative and always, even from our end, as facilitators, we are continuously learning. So it's two way. And uh, sure, no question and no idea is too small during these sessions. Every idea is welcome and every question is welcome. And, and just to Back repeat, to I'm just trying to spell it out really clearly so then we can understand where to focus our energy. So I hope we've got that principle of, you know, it's not hard, is it? It's if you blow on a fire, it gets hotter, warm air rises. And if you can trap that heat into a mass, then you've got yourself a cooker. And, it, and if you can bring those three things together, you have a huge efficiency gain. And that's what we want to get excited about. And the reason I say so much about oil and the oil descent is, especially in, we still think we're going to solve our problems with technology. And I think we're looking in the wrong direction. This is the direction we should be looking in. So thank you everybody for your attention this week. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks everyone. And good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs> Good night.